Hello, everyone. So today, as I announced earlier, I have Dr. Richard Pether with me. He has been in the diagnostic and therapeutic um, pharmaceutical companies for more than 20 years. And he's here today because he has also helped with developing imaging for patients that has had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia. So imaging that they have been related to amyloid deposits. And again, as I mentioned before, we're talking about Alzheimer's dementia. So if any of you guys or any of your family members or friends have been diagnosed or they have any cognition decline, any problems, uh, difficulty in performing familiar tasks, or they don't feel themselves mentally speaking, they don't have that brain optimization anymore. That's where we start you know, determining, are you a good candidate to test? And this test is specifically for cognitive decline, for cognition problems, that it can happen as early as in their 40s or 50s. So we don't need to just you know, wait until you are in your 60s or 70s to really test and take action because this is the difference. It's not only going into what genetically you're predisposed to, it's what can we do from our early age in at early stage of diagnosis to really modify these gene expressions. So here, Dr. Richard, thanks so much for being here, for sharing all your knowledge and specifically for educating our community. It's my pleasure. Thanks very much for the invitation. Now we've, um, so I, I'm Richard Pither. I've been uh, working on the development of this uh, Alzheimer risk test for over eight years now with my team, in, uh, my, mainly in the UK, but also with some very important scientific collaborators in the United States as well. Uh, and, and it's a test that's all about identifying those at the very early stages um, of, uh, of based on their genetics who may be at future risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And as you said, Dr. Ramos, the, the advantage there, of course, is that the earlier we identify those high-risk individuals, the earlier we can undertake the interventions to reduce overall risk. So early is good. Exactly. And when we said testing, um, so the modalities that uh, we have are saliva and blood testing, right, Dr. Peter? Yes, that's right. So um, basically, we need a DNA sample, and that's very easily obtained from saliva. It's very convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, a kit can be administered by in the, in the clinical practice or actually by uh, the patient in their own home. Very simple and straightforward to use. Mm -hmm. um, if for some reason saliva is not available, I mean, some people actually lose the ability to produce saliva in, in, as they get older, then we can actually use a simple blood sample as well, which obviously is just a, a straightforward draw taken in the clinic. So that DNA is then extracted and, and, and genotyped on a, a proprietary uh, genotyping array that we've developed in partnership with Thermo Fisher Scientific, who are one of the, the largest life science companies in the world, US company. Nice. And actually, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Peter, I was reading that uh, the company has also reached out to many different neurologists. Uh, there is a, a good advantage now that we're putting this into, you know, many different um, providers. So they know that there are hopes for patients that they had any possibly, you know, risk factors based on family members, or they are just having signs or symptoms, uh, you know, of cognition, as we were saying, or understanding the visual, the spatial information they are withdrawing from their work or social activity because they don't feel themselves. So uh, those are great news. I was reading about it, that it's, it's a spreading this uh, new modality of testing in many different neurologists. So uh, is it, you know, how, how does it is like it's being approved or how is it in conventional medicine or how, what do you, yeah. can you tell us about that, please? So, so there are now 150 clinics that are registered to use this test in the United States. So it's being very widely adopted. And, um, and really, there are two types of patient that are benefiting. I mean, one, as you mentioned earlier, is that patient who may have concerns or early symptoms Mm -hmm. not feeling themselves, their memory's not quite as good as it used to be, uh, they're getting confused in finding the right words for things, and they're worried that they may have the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. and they want to get tested to confirm one way or the other. And of course, a lot of those people won't have Alzheimer's disease. Those problems can be caused by anxiety, stress, depression. So it's obviously great news if you find out that you don't have that, and you can sort of think about the other, the other causes of those symptoms. But for the people that do have uh, high genetic risk and those early symptoms. The good news is that the interventions 
uh, that are available today, even before you talk about disease modifying drugs that you know may come through in the future, there's loads of things that can stabilize or even reverse those early symptoms. And I know you yourself, Dr. Amos, are very familiar with those and have had huge success with them. So, sure. you know, there's no really, there's no bad news here. The good news, if you are at high risk, is there's lots that can be done. So that's really important. Mm-hmm. Now, the other group of people that are using this test are younger people who maybe have elder relatives, parents or grandparents mm-hmm. who have been diagnosed previous, previously with Alzheimer's disease, and they want to find out whether they've inherited any increased risk for the future so mm-hmm. they can start taking action now to reduce overall lifetime risk. You know, And we know that the work of Mia Kivapelto and others in the so-called finger studies has shown that even those people with a high genetic propensity, they take the steps early, they can reduce overall lifetime risk. It's estimated that something like 40 to 50% of the causes of Alzheimer's disease are actually modifiable. So if we know we're at risk, there are steps we can take and that reduces overall risk. Exactly, and that's very important uh, for all the audience to really take notes of that point because it's not only, okay, I just don't wanna know because if I have Alzheimer's, then you know what's gonna happen to me or you know, Alzheimer genetic risk. Mm. It's actually, it's not your destiny. It's now you have the power to really get to manage those genes expressions, which is epigenetics, based on all the different factors that it might be associated with you and your health. So if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you have problems with your hormones, if there are toxins, if there are heavy metals, all those you know nutritional deficiencies, those factors are gonna make the expressions of those genes to go up, right? And that increases the chances for the developing of the disease at some point in your life. So as mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Peter said, it's just, you have actually now the power to really take action. And that is what we are wanna, you know, we want to really uh, have for you guys take home points. It's that it's not just for you to be scared, it's actually to really be proactive in your own health. And in the brain is so important. Cognition is, as I was talking to a patient the other day, I mean, there are so many diseases, but one that is a very, you know, it causes a lot of stress in the community in any person that they know that they're losing their cognition. It's something that knowing that it's modifiable, it's huge. It's an advantage that everybody needs to really some way or the other try to test it so we can get into plan. Let's do this. Let's avoid that. You know, so it that's, mm-hmm. that's the beauty of this test. It, it's, it's hugely important, this whole point about empowering, because knowledge is power to do something and change outcomes okay now the frustration is that it's still not widely enough understood i mean two years ago Mm -hmm. the lancet commission in neurology actually published this review of all the data that was out there where they concluded that 40 to 50 percent of the lifestyle and and risk avoidance strategies can be modified to reduce overall risk so that's the good news Mm -hmm. the bad news is the primary care physicians or general practice as we would call them in the uk they still this message still hasn't really got down to everyone yet. So, you know, people, as you said, people do get scared about mm-hmm. the fact that they perceive there's nothing that can be done, but that's very far from the truth. And I think it's really important that, you know, our test and people like you are at the, at the cutting edge of, of clinical practice are really understanding this message. And then that gets through to people and gives them hope because they know that even if they have inherited some increased risk, there's still plenty that can be done. So, you know, one of our mantras and, and messages, and unfortunately, you are seeing this more and more now, even in the in the newspapers, in the press, mm-hmm. you know, modifying risk factors to reduce mm-hmm. overall risk of Alzheimer's disease has been some of the most important science that's come out in the last 20 years, in my view. All the hype recently, of course, has been in, about this new drug, this lesanamab drug from ESI, which we all hope will be approved by the FDA next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it will be available and suitable for some people, but not everyone and not at that very early risk stage. So um, I think it's really important that we have all these different sort of approaches from very early risk to much later stage disease. Really positive story. Um, uh, But people need to understand that, you know, to know their risk is to be able to do something about it. and, And that's the most powerful message, I think. That's right. And as a matter of fact, talking now about therapeutics, it's um, you know, what it's available. It's just uh, medication that they can help to, you know, and, and not for everybody, because uh, we know that scientifically speaking, that it helps just to 
not led the progression of the disease, right? But it really That's doesn't right. modify whatever has been happening, you know, in the brain, you know, the deposits, the amyloid deposits and all the changes that has happened, it won't reverse that. So if we take a step ahead of, that is huge. That will really change yeah. the whole inflammation yeah. that it happens because definitely there is this neuroinflammation that is happening that it makes things even worse. So if we can take a step ahead of that, that really changes the prognosis rather than just waiting until you are you know, diagnosed with in a very advanced stage where medications, they can do you know, maybe a 50 or less percent for you know, improving the cognition and all the different functions of the brain. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the amyloid deposition in the brain is, as you said, a relatively late stage event. And, and a lot of things are going on before that. So, uh, of course, it's great news that for people where that amyloid really is building up already, that this drug you know, may be able to help them and reduce the rate of decline. That, that's really positive news. But as you said, the earlier we get in, the more we can affect those events leading up to that point and have an even more beneficial effect because, you know, amyloid is toxic to neurons. And once we lose neurons, it's very hard to reverse that. So, um, so yeah, early is good uh, and, and, and gives you a much broader range of interventions that are possible. Yeah. Now for, for people that they have heard maybe terminologies like APOE4, tell us more Mm. about that and what is that related to, you know, the test that we do. Okay, so a- APOE4 has been known about for maybe 30 years, and, and it's it's a single gene, the mm-hmm. apolipoprotein E gene, which is involved in cholesterol and transport of other of other lipids and other uh, um, you know other molecules. And we all have two copies of this gene, and if you carry one or more copies of the E4 variant of that gene, you're considered to be at increased risk. People may have seen the news about Chris Hemsworth came out, you know, a week or so ago. Yes. He was found uh, to have two copies of E4, and that gives you something like an eight to tenfold increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And, and Chris has decided to sort of publicise and talk about this, uh, you know, and 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 reflect on his own sort of you know choices going forward. But most people don't carry. It's very rare to have two copies. Most people, if they have any. APOE4 at all, it's just one copy. And that gives you maybe a, a, a three to four fold increase or maybe two to three fold increase risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. But the point is that just because you have E4, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Conversely, if you don't have E4, let's suppose you have two copies of E3, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you won't get Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so it's not diagnostic. About 40% of those people diagnosed with chronic Alzheimer's disease don't have E4 at all. So mm-hmm. an APOE4 test has really limited clinical utility and it's really not used very widely in the clinic for that reason. Cool. So what we've shown in our scientific publications is mm-hmm. that whether you carry E4 or not, we can still differentiate high and low genetic risk, okay? Because rather than just looking at one single gene variant, we look at 112,000 gene Mm -hmm. variants, and that gives you a far more comprehensive description of genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. APOE is included in there, Mm -hmm. but a whole, you know, many, many other genes and and, and variants are included as well. So it gives you a much more comprehensive picture. Exactly. And that's what also I want my audience to understand, that it's not just talking about one gene. We're talking about many different, because we're complex. The genome is very complex, and we can just not pinpoint to one. It's many different ones and also associations. What, you know, all these genes, all these different variations that they happen, how are they correlated? And we as a clinician, we can determine, okay, this is something that, yes, is going to put you at a high risk or medium or low probability of developing. But then again, as we were speaking earlier, it's everything that we are going to start doing from that point to lower the chances or maintain you at a low risk, because that is also important. If you have a low probability of developing, we don't want you to get to a medium or high risk because that can happen, right? So as you were saying, yeah. so even if you have the protective, it doesn't mean that you won't develop. And the same, if mm. you have it, it doesn't mean that you are gonna, you know, the likelihood is that you definitely you will develop. So it can be either or, depending on what you do on a daily basis. And that's what I tell all my patients. So that's- Exactly right. I mean, you know, your, your genetic risk is, is, is kind of fixed and you're born with it and you inherit it and you live with it. Age is the single is, is the single largest risk factor on mm-hmm. top of genetics, because as we get older, 
we all are exposed to and accumulate environmental and lifestyle risk. So that's what we modify. And you're right, you could have a very modest genetic risk, but if you live badly and don't take seriously these other risk factors, then you could put yourself into a high risk category. I mean, you know, a lot of the cardiovascular and type two diabetes, those types of things, I mean, they're really quite strong indicators for Alzheimer's risk. So if we don't end up with cardiovascular or diabetic risk, then our overall Alzheimer's risk goes down as well. So there's just two, you know, really quite profound examples and, and examples that are very common, you know, in, in US society, in UK society, you know, people don't live as well as they should. So so that, that means, you know, you get this kind of accumulative effect. And, you know, the, the, the more we take these things seriously, the less Alzheimer's risk we can, we can sort of, uh, you know, live with, you know, going, up, going, going forward, we expect to live with. Exactly. Because, again, it's not only uh, Alzheimer's dementia. There are many types of dementia, that's, as you were yes. mentioning, depending on what the risk factors and everything that you have been doing until the point that maybe you listen to this uh, lecture that, you know, if you're having any vasculitis or any inflammation in your vessels, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, if you have hormonal imbalances, if you have a high burden of toxins, if you have nutritional imbalances, they are all are going to make a huge risk for your cognition, for your brain. So the idea is that we put everything together with this test. We recognize what is the prediction for you uh, of having any type of, you know, Alzheimer's and then take action. So again, going to the test, it's a blood or it's a saliva, either or depending. Uh, they all take about six weeks, right, Dr. Peter, to get back the results. And then after that, we'll sit down, we have a consultation and this is one of the samples. This is the kit for the saliva. And it's very simple. Actually, I want to start collecting with my husband uh, so you guys can see it. And my husband, he's a neurosurgeon, so he's very in tune with everything, you know, happening with the brain. Uh, and the idea is that, again, you take control of your health. And we're speaking here specifically about, about the brain health, because brain is as important as any other organs. And the earlier we catch any medical changes, any type of biochemistry, any hormonal, any nutrition, anything that is going to impact your neurons, the better prognosis you will have. Is that correct, Dr. Peter? That's correct. I mean, it comes back to the point we started with, really, that the earlier we understand risk, the more we can do about it, the more opportunity. There's a big window. I mean, uh, e even in Alzheimer's disease, where amyloid is beginning to deposit in the brain, it's estimated that maybe that happens up to 20 years before clinical symptoms. So mm -hmm. that's a big window, big window for intervention. That's that's the that's the great thing, you know, and... Um, and we should all understand, I mean, very much like we, you know, we want to know about risks for cancer or heart disease. I mean, you know, we just brain health and, and Alzheimer's disease should just be added to that list. There's so much technology now yes. to help us understand these these different sort of risks that we're exposed to. And, and, and for all of those conditions, there are steps we can take, you know, to, to manage that risk. And, and, and that's where choice comes in. Information, power, choice. I mean, I think that's what it's all about, really. Exactly. So for healthy aging, when my patients, they come and they want to do a full, you know, panel of healthy aging, I do include it because as, as uh, Dr. Peter was saying, there's really no age limitation. You can do it as early, you know, in your 30s, in your 40s, because it takes 20 years to really start developing symptoms. And when that happens, it might be too late. So why not testing? Why not doing it at an early age when you really can control that? Obviously, as we age, as he was mentioning, it's, you know, all the different changes that it happens it makes, you know, risk higher, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you will develop. I have patients in their 70s that they are in great health brain-wise, they have no problems, and there are others in their 30s that they're already having declined cognition. So again, it's very, um, you know, personalized, and that's what it is. And it's also in functional medicine, we personalize whatever approach we're going to take. So, but again, this is available. This is something that we are very proud to announce and to communicate to all of you. Please talk to your doctor, ask about how you can get a sample, either if it's a functional or a conventional doctor, if it's a neurologist, obviously. Uh, it has been, as uh, Dr. Peter said, it has been you know, expanded to many different clinics in the United States. And please take advantage of the technology. Take advantage in your own, you know, for your own brain optimization. That is going to make a change. That is going to help you to really maintain healthy longevity. Anything else, Dr. Peter, that you want to share with us? Any? I think we've covered it all. Well, I, 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 I think one thing I should add is, is that the the science behind this has been developed, um, you know, by my colleagues over the last eight years or so. But before that, and working in collaboration with the 
scientific community. There's 20, 25 years work behind this really, mm -hmm. primarily uh, by scientists in the UK and the US. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Cardiff University team of um, Valentina Rescott Price and Professor Julie Williams, and also Professor Sir John Hardy at UCL. These are the, the drivers of the whole kind of polygenic risk concept behind Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working with Professor Mike Weiner at uh, UC San Francisco to validate the performance of the test in his longitudinal Alzheimer cohort study. Uh, these scientists are absolutely pivotal. And um, what we've done is take that basic science and turn it into a, a robust clinical test so that everyone can understand their risk and, and as you say, be empowered to do something about that. So it's 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 a real pleasure to be able to um, to bring this test and make it available to uh, to your patients. Yes, and we are so grateful for that, for all these multi collaboration, all your brains together, you know, trying to get and to help people because again, brain is so important. You can lose anything, but when you lose your brain, that's a different story there, right? So definitely again for you guys, it's available. Please you can visit my website, www.drfatideramos.com. Um, you know, there is other ways that we can communicate uh via email, via text. There are so many ways. But the idea is that it's available. The idea is that you guys have the power. And whenever you're ready, whenever you Hannah, you want <clears throat> to take that extra step and get to know more about your brain, it's available. And again, thanks so much. Many blessings to you and to all your team that have come up with this excellent approach in technology for brain cognition. Thank you. Pleasure speaking to you. Likewise. Bye-bye. Goodbye.